All the videos in this channel are viewer suggested. I've had a lot of requests to put together a review on the worst 10 products ever tested. So let's jump right into it. If you're looking to save a few dollars on a power tool battery, you might decide to buy a knockoff battery and you might just regret that decision. I compared several 6 amp hour knockoff batteries, including the Amatyke battery, against a genuine Milwaukee 6 amp hour battery. And the very first sign that things weren't going to go too well for the Amatyke is the weight of the battery. And the Amatyke only weighed 596 grams. And the genuine Milwaukee is much heavier at 1,077 grams. How in the world is a knockoff going to perform just as well as a much larger and heavier battery? To compare the batteries, I bought a 175 watt Milwaukee power supply. Each one of the batteries powered up a fan which draws around 150 watts. And the $26 Amatite claims to deliver 6 amp hours. And that's a very good price if it can indeed deliver that much power. Unfortunately, the Amatite ran out of juice in only 15 minutes and 51 seconds. I used the genuine Milwaukee battery as the litmus test, and the genuine Milwaukee was just getting warmed up at 15 minutes. At 23 minutes, the Milwaukee still has a lot more juice to give, and the genuine Milwaukee is still smiling at 32 minutes. And a 6 amp hour Milwaukee is finally out of juice at 39 minutes and 15 seconds, so the Milwaukee lasted more than twice as long as the Amatyke. The 6 amp hour Milwaukee outperformed all the knockoffs, and the Amatyke finished in last place among all the batteries and the knockoffs. But things were about to get a lot worse for the Amatyke. A battery powered tool is only as good as the battery, so I compared the batteries using a Milwaukee drill and a torque adapter driving in a lag bolt. And the Milwaukee made very quick work of the 5 inch lag bolts and made it to 183 inch pounds. And the Amatyke battery gave up very early at only 89 inch pounds, which is less than half as much as the Milwaukee. So once again, the Milwaukee 6 amp hour battery finished in first place, and the Amatyke finished in dead last place once again. I then used an impact driver to compare performance of each battery, driving in three lag bolts per battery. And the Amatyke really struggled driving in the lag bolts, averaging over seven seconds per bolt. And the genuine Milwaukee drove in three lag bolts without any problem and averaged right at six seconds per bolt. And once again, the genuine Milwaukee came out on top, and the Amatyke once again finished in dead last place. An angle grinder is a very thirsty tool. And the Amakite is really struggling. And it's hard to believe, but the Amakite has already given up in only 10 seconds. And I'm unable to get the grinder to power up again. And the genuine Milwaukee battery lasted over six and a half minutes and made a lot of progress sanding the paint off of the metal. And once again, the Amatite finished in last place. If you don't want your house or shop to burn down, it's a very good idea to have batteries that are short circuit protected. To test the batteries for short circuit protection, I used two metal conductors attached to the positive and negative contacts of the battery. I also used a current meter to keep track of the energy spike and the duration once the battery experienced a short. And the Amakite made it to 123 amps and the current is gradually dropping. And the current finally dropped to zero at almost 8 seconds. Definitely not a safe battery in my opinion. So the Amatite delivers less than half the battery capacity and in my opinion it's also a very unsafe battery. Definitely one of the worst 10 products I've ever tested. And the ZSP jack stands definitely earned a spot in the worst 10 products ever tested list. If you're ever crawling under a vehicle, your safety and life depends on jack stands doing their job. The manufacturer claims that it's a six ton adjustable performance car and truck jack stand. And the manufacturer claims that this jack stand is as steady as a rock and I'm not joking. These things look terrifyingly unsafe. And the ZSP is an extremely light duty set of jack stands with a very poor build quality. I also measured the amount of side to side movement of the center tube and the ZSP has the most side to side movement of all the brands at three quarters of an inch. In the first test, I measured the amount of force it takes to cause a vehicle to fall off the jack stands. Most of the jack stands performed very well at over 180 pounds of force before the jack stands fell over. And the ZSP claims to be steady as a rock to instill trust and confidence and to take $178 out of your pocket. And both jack stands broke at only 95 pounds of lateral force. Definitely the most dangerous jack stands I've ever seen. I tested all the jack stands in several additional tests and all the jack stands besides the ZSP survived the test. Most of the jack stands took over 20,000 pounds to crush in a controlled straight downward direction. I repaired the ZSP and tested it once again. And parts were flying off the ZSP at around 5,000 pounds. Had over 40,000 pounds to crush the jack stand, the US Jack is feeling pretty happy about its performance. And the Big Red also showed off some pretty impressive dance moves, but not the ZSP. There are a lot of other high quality jack stands out there, but I recommend avoiding the ZSP. A battery with a name like Ultrafire definitely seems doomed to make the worst 10 list. It definitely seems like a name that indicates the battery has a quality issue. 18650 batteries are used in all sorts of gadgets, including headlamps, portable fans, and even tool batteries. 
The Ultrafire is rated by the manufacturer at a very impressive 9,800 milliamp hours. The first sign that the Ultrafire was in trouble was when it stepped onto the scale and only weighed a little over 35 grams. On the other hand, the Panasonic is only rated for 3,500 milliamp hours and it weighed 12 grams more than the Ultrafire. In the first test, I compared the internal resistance of the batteries. Internal resistance is the opposition to flow of current within the battery. After fully charging the batteries, the two Ultrafire batteries that I tested had an internal resistance of 48 and 31 respectively. Not good. I tested a couple of Samsung batteries and they had a much better internal resistance of only 11.7 each. We definitely want the internal resistance to be low. I then used a battery tester to measure the actual capacity of the batteries. And the two Ultrafire batteries that I tested are supposed to make 9,800 milliamp hours. And they only had a capacity of 1,230 and 1,163. Looking at actual weight, the Ultrafire batteries were very light compared to the brand names like the Samsung, LG, Sony, and Panasonic. When it comes to being honest about its capacity, it's liar liar pants on fire for the Ultrafire. The Ultrafire only delivered 12.2% of its rated capacity, the worst in the showdown. To compare cold temperature performance, I then tested the batteries at around 6 degrees Fahrenheit. Once again, the Ultrafire really struggled at only 12.5% of its rating. The LG, Samsung, Sony, and Panasonic brands performed a lot better, ranging from around 90% to 100% of their rating. I then compared the batteries for performance under a light to a moderate current load, ranging from 1 to 10 amps. At only 1 amp, the Ultrafire voltage dropped to just over 4 volts. At a very small load of 2 amps, the Ultrafire was already beginning to struggle at only 3.8 volts. At 5 amps, the Ultrafire was just about ready to throw in the towel at 3.27 volts. And it was over for the Ultrafire at 6 amps at only 1.66 volts. I then installed the batteries and fans to compare the runtime, And the Ultrafire lasted 102 minutes. On the other hand, the Japanese and Korean batteries lasted more than twice as long. Considering the 9,800 milliamp rating and the awful performance, the Ultrafire definitely deserves to be on the worst 10 products list. The next product to make the worst 10 product list is this HHO or oxyhydrogen generator. The manufacturer claims that you can reduce fuel consumption by up to 35%. It also claims to reduce emissions and extend engine life. It even claims to increase engine torque and improve acceleration. You can have all this capability for around $200. The kit comes with a dry cell hydrogen generator, a couple of rubber hoses, and a holding tank for water and electrolyte solution. It also comes with a bubbler, wires, and electrical connectors. The water canister is supposed to send water to the hydrogen generator. Then the hydrogen generator makes a gas which goes back to the water canister. By the way, this gas that goes back to the canister is highly explosive. From the water container, the gas goes to the bubbler and then into the engine. There's quite a bit of electrical and plumbing that has to happen to make this kit operational. This includes permanently altering some things under the engine bay, such as drilling a hole in the air intake assembly. There's a relay that powers up the HHO unit while the vehicle is in use. In addition to buying the kit, you'll also need to buy some potassium hydroxide for the electrolyte solution. After installing the kit, I inspected the spark plugs in the combustion chamber for carbon buildup. Before powering up the HHO generator, I made a couple of runs from 0 to 60 miles per hour. After making two runs without the HHO attached, I installed the fuse in the HHO setup. And the HHO kit is working properly and there are bubbles that are going to the engine. I made a couple of 0 to 60 runs with the HHO attached. Unfortunately, the vehicle did not show any improvement in performance and actually was a little bit slower from 0 to 60 miles per hour. No improvement with acceleration, but I was hoping to see a cleaner spark plug or combustion chamber. Unfortunately, no noticeable improvement. I then tested fuel efficiency using a fuel injected generator. The generator had to supply electrical power to the HHO kit. The generator ran for 19 minutes and 46 seconds before installing the HHO kit. After installing the kit, the generator ran just fine. Unfortunately, the generator did not show any improvement in fuel efficiency. In fact, the engine only ran for 19 minutes and 36 seconds or 10 seconds less with the HHO setup installed. I then tested the HHO generator a second time to see if we'd see any improvement. This time, the HHO setup did a little bit worse at 19 18 minutes and 25 seconds. So the HHO kit failed to deliver on any of the claims and it's a waste of money in my opinion. For only $19, you can turn your drill into a circular saw. The circular saw can also double as an angle grinder. Unfortunately, the saw did not come with assembly instructions, but it is pretty simple to put together. A few nuts, bolts, and about five minutes of assembly and the circular saw is ready for action. The build construction seems very light duty, but then again, the cost is under $20. You can even cut at an angle. Maximum cutting depth is about an inch. Made in China. To serve as a comparison, let's first make a cut through one inch oak using a cordless Milwaukee circular saw. 1.3 seconds to make the cut. As a right-handed person, holding the drill with the left hand and holding the saw with the right seems a bit awkward. And the circular saw is vibrating quite a bit and seems pretty sketchy to say the least. The cut made by the attachment is on the bottom and the Milwaukee saw is on the top. 
And it's a much smoother cut by the Milwaukee saw. And there's quite a bit of wobble with the output shaft and the blade. Not all drill attachments are junk. This Malco metal cutting shear did an amazing job cutting through sheet metal. The Malco shears made very easy work of cutting through aluminum flashing. It also did a great job cutting through 20 gauge steel. On the other hand, the circular saw attachment is more likely to cause an injury than it is to make a quality cut. Definitely one of the worst products I've ever tested. An angle grinder can be adapted to many different things, but this drill attachment is extremely dangerous. At a price of only $12, it may be very tempting to buy this angle grinder drill attachment. It claims to have a three jaw chuck that's firm clamping, made of high carbon steel, Unfortunately, I don't have an angle grinder that has a 10 millimeter arbor. I have quite a few angle grinders and they all have 5 HNs arbors. So I do have an adapter that has to be adapted so the adapter will work with the grinder. I'll also use a 5 8 inch grade 8 nut to serve as a coupler. A typical drill spins at 2 to 3,000 RPM. However, a grinder spins about three times as fast. Unfortunately, there's way too much wobble from things being out of alignment. Definitely off to a very sketchy start. Fortunately, I bought a 4 inch angle grinder locally that has 10 millimeter threads, but the angle grinder has the wrong thread pitch. So I'll have to use a thread tap to reshape the threads. This is definitely not a perfect fix, but it'll get the job done. As Cousin Eddie likes to say, good enough for government work. And the chuck seems perfectly aligned with the angle grinder shaft. Let's see how it performs anyway drilling through a 2x4 with a 3 8 inch drill bit. And the angle grinder drill attachment doesn't waste any time and made very quick work of drilling through the 2x4. To prevent the drill from walking, I'll make an indentation in the quarter inch flat iron. I'll go ahead and use a cobalt split point twist drill bit. I applied a lot of downward force to prevent the drill bit from work hardening the mild steel. And it's only 3.6 seconds to drill the hole. And 10,000 RPM for a drill is just way too fast. While most of the angle grinder attachments were sketchy, there are actually some good attachments like this belt sander. It has a unique design that allows it to sand curved objects like pipes. While there are some good angle grinder attachments, I highly recommend avoiding the dangerous ones like this drill adapter. The next product to earn a place on this dreadful list is the Performance Tool 3 8 inch ratchet. The $7 price tag is the first clue that this ratchet might have a performance issue. However, we do find affordable products that perform very well all the time. Manufacturers sell ratchets using marketing information about arc swing and tooth camp. They're trying to convince you that their ratchet is best for working in a tight space. So I compared all the ratchets working within a 30 degree space. And the Performance Tools gear set is extremely sloppy and it's only able to advance one tooth at a time within a 30 degree space. And the ratchet really struggled on this test and it took 39 right to left swings to finally complete one 360 degree rotation. On the other hand, zero degree gear wrench in the Icon Pro completed the test in less than half the back and forth passes. And the Performance Tool finished in last place in this category. A ratchet with a lot of back drag really makes removing and installing fasteners in tight spaces a challenge at times. If there's enough space, adding resistance to the socket using finger pressure allows the ratchet to make progress, but that's not always an option. For this test, I used a 7 8 inch socket, fishing line, and a scale to measure the back drag. And a performance tool once again really struggled at 698 grams of back drag. Other affordable ratchets like the SADA have less than half the amount of back drag. A high performance ratchet will perform well on both the working arc swing and the back drag test. While Performance Tool didn't finish in last place on this test, it did finish in the last three. If your hands are greasy, a stiff directional lever can really make things difficult. I measured directional lever performance using a scale and a screwdriver. And a Performance Tool ratchet finished in dead last on this test at 1,561 grams or about three and a half pounds of force to change directions. In the final test, I compared the failure load of all the ratchets. This is a 3 inch ratchet and should easily handle 200 foot pounds of force. And the buttery saw performance tool ratchet is all bent out of shape at only 58.43 foot pounds. A look inside the ratchet and there's a lot of damage. And all the ratchets made it past 200 foot pounds of torque except for performance tool. And the performance tool ratchet just proved that the only thing it'll loosen is money from your wallet. Definitely the worst ratchet I've ever tested. And Performance Tool distinguished itself by being the only brand with two products to make the list. Unfortunately, the Performance Tool bolt cutters are absolutely terrible. However, the Performance Tool bolt cutters are not the least expensive product this time. In fact, the Genford bolt cutters cost $3 less. So I tested the Genford brand first. In the first test, the bolt cutters competed to see which brand can make the easiest work of cutting through a 16 penny nail. I put together a tester that holds the cutters and the nail. It also measures the downward force applied to the handle. The locking pliers held the end of the nail to keep the nail from becoming a projectile. And the very affordable Genford brand made the cut with 120 pounds of squeezing force. The good news is that the performance tool barely edged out the Genford in the first test at 114 pounds. As a point of reference, the more expensive Cabri tool bolt cutters made 
very easy work of the nail and about half the force at only 61 pounds of squeezing force on the handle. Very impressive. The German made Knipex brand performed almost the same at 62 pounds. These are bolt cutters and a 16 penny nail isn't even a challenge for a good set of bolt cutters. So let's stop piddling around and let's test the bolt cutters on a deck screw. And it took a lot of squeezing force for the $7 Genford bolt cutters to make the cut at 166 pounds, but it did survive the test with minimal damage to the cutting knives. Unfortunately, the deck screw outperformed the performance tool bolt cutters. The deck screw held up just fine, but the lower jaw on the performance tool bolt cutters became badly bent at 164 pounds of force on the handle. As a point of reference, the Capri tools easily cut through the deck screw at only 89 pounds of force. Very impressive. And the cutting knives still look very good. And the Knipex also made very easy work of the deck screw at 113 pounds of force on the handle. The cutting knives remained in good shape. And the Performance Tool Bolt Cutters were the only brand that did not survive cutting through the deck screw. While assessing wear is highly subjective, all of the brands received a damage rating of 1 or 2, indicating very little or only minor damage, except for the Performance Tool Bolt Cutters. Cutting through a 3 16 inch drill bit, now we're finally getting into bolt cutter territory. And high quality bolt cutters like the ARES made the cut in only 166 pounds, and the cutting knives are still in good shape. Just like the ARES, the Capri tools made very easy work of the drill bit at only 134 pounds. So the very hard drill bit wiped out five additional brands. And none of the bolt cutters had a chance at surviving a hex key, but it gave us their failure load. And the best brands in the lineup made it past 300 pounds of handle force, but the performance tool finished in dead last. And the next brand to make the worst tool list is the ShopTech C-Clamp, but the performance tool brand was a close second. The advertised capacity for each of the C-Clamps is 6 inches. The ShopTech has a cast ductile iron frame. The actual capacity is only 5 and 5 8 inches. Throw capacity makes a difference on being able to reach and then apply force on the right part of the workpiece. And the shop tech just doesn't offer too much reach at only 2.25 inches. When trying to clamp two objects together, an adjusting screw with lots of slop can cause a workpiece to move out of position. And the shop tech has 0.095 inches of movement. The handle length, thread pitch, and build quality vary significantly. Some of the C-clamps are really light duty. To standardize the amount of handle force applied to each C-clamp, I put together this attachment which will allow torque to be applied to each vice handle equally. I've got a click style torque wrench that I'll go ahead and set to only 50 inch pounds and I'll then use it for testing each of the C-clamps. The ShopTech's adjustment screw is pretty gritty and not at all smooth. With 50 inch pounds of torque on the handle, the ShopTech is finished at 396 pounds of clamping force. The Performance Tool Clamp has a lot more slop at 0.332 inches or about twice as much slop as any of the other brands. And the Performance Tools adjustment screw is very gritty and only made it to 282 pounds to take the last position from the ShopTech. Applying an equal amount of leverage to all the C-clamps, the best performing brands delivered over 1,000 pounds of clamping force. And the shop tech ran out of steam at 396 pounds and performance tool 282 pounds. So for now, the shop tech is actually outperforming the performance tool. And the performance tool also finished in last place for adjusting screw slot, but the competition is not over. A stuck or stub and swivel head causes the workpiece or clamp to move around quite a bit when trying to tighten the C-clamp. To test the build quality of the swivel heads, I'll place this ball transfer unit under the flat iron so it'll rotate freely. I'll then apply 500 pounds of clamping force on the swivel head. And the shop tech swivel head is stuck and a swivel head is slipping on the metal at 56 inch pounds at 2.5 inches from the fulcrum. And a performance tool finally outperformed the shop tech at 25 pounds, but there's a lot more competition left in this showdown. And it's a big sigh of relief for the performance tool brand as the shop tech finished in last place in this event. When I can't get enough clamping force with just using hand force on the handle, a cheetah bar really helps. So let's see how much force we can achieve before bending the handles. And the shop tech made it to 812 pounds before the handle became bent. And a performance tool ran out of performance at 1,416 pounds and it didn't go down quietly. The handle is now bent. After yet another round of competition, the performance tool C clamp is beginning to distance itself from the shop tech, but the competition is not over. If a clamp is already under load, let's see how much holding force each brand can offer before experiencing damage. And the shop tech went in two different directions at 980 pounds. The performance tools adjustment screw doesn't offer too much clamp load, but the frame does have pretty good strength at almost 4,200 pounds. After a pretty rough start, the performance tool brand recovered nicely, but the shop tech did not. And the shop tech finished in a very distant last place. To round out the bottom 10 list, the diagonal cutters made by Illinois Industrial Tools made the list. It's a good thing Performance Tool did not compete in this event. By the way, the Illinois Industrial Tools diagonal cutters are made in China and not Illinois. The first sign of trouble for the Illinois Industrial Cutters is that the axle joint is extremely loose. When there's quite a bit of wobble, the cutters don't line up and you get very inconsistent results. The average person can exert a squeezing force of around 100 pounds. 
Just like the bolt cutter review, I'll be using the same tester to compare diagonal cutters. In the first test, we cut through 16 penny nails. You'll need a very strong hand or probably need to use two hands to cut through a 16 penny nail with the Illinois Industrial Tools diagonal cutters at 195 pounds. It might be tempting to think that you have to spend a lot for performance, but for under $20, you can buy the Irwin diagonal cutters. And you won't need buy any cans to cut through a super soft nail either. And the Irwin made the cut at only 78 pounds compared to 195 for the Illinois Industrial diagonal cutters. Just like the Irwin, the $21 channel lock diagonal cutters made this look way too easy at only 73 pounds. Out of 15 brands, the Illinois Industrial brand is in last place after the first round of competition. Nails are very soft compared to screws. So let's see how the cutters compare on a deck screw. Unfortunately, the Illinois Industrial Tools wasn't able to make the cut and the pliers gave up at 342 pounds of force. The diagonal cutters are ruined, but the deck screw is still in good shape. These are diagonal cutters and not bolt cutters. So let's see if any of the brands can survive cutting through a drill bit. And the very affordable Irwin cutters made the cut at only 191 pounds and the cutting knives are still in great shape. Surprisingly, over half the brand survived the drill bit. I then used the shaft of a socket adapter to measure the failure load of the rest of the brands. And one of the Irwin's jaws broke off at 320 pounds and the cutting knives still look sharp. All of the diagonal cutters did a better job cutting through nails, screws, and drill bits than the Illinois Industrial Tools brand and they all had a higher failure load. The worst 10 products, obviously I don't accept sponsorships and I buy everything tested on the channel. All the videos this channel our viewers suggested so if you have a video idea i hope you'll take time to leave a comment thanks so much for watching please take care and look forward to next time